Thank you. Uh, hi. So, um, first of all, I just I want to say what I'm embedded in. I'm a writer who's embedded in in pair. I am not a computer scientist. And I, I hope it's, I think it is completely obvious to everybody that every pair person you've met or encountered here is incredibly kind, not just brilliant, but um, kind and creative and human. And I am just so lucky <laughs> to, to, have, to be there. Those, um, that sense is, I can testify, is 100% genuine and real. They're actually that nice and kind. Um, so my Venn diagram, is, let's see, I wrote it down. It's Western tradition and old privileged white man. And I am at the intersection of those two. And, and <laughs> the first one is actually really important because I am only talking about the Western tradition and my interest is in what I'm gonna be talking about is the way in which that tradition's encounter with machine learning may change some of that tradition's oldest ideas about stuff. The sorts of stuff that uh, you only call metaphysical if you are trying to be sort of cyberpunk or uh, indicate some level of distance from the topic. I'm not very cyberpunk, but um, I chose the word uh, carefully. Oh, there's a, there's a uh, changer. Excellent. So um, in some sense, machine learning has, has occasioned a moral panic, and it has earned it. I mean, I don't have to, everybody here understands better than I do the depth of the ethical and moral cha uh, challenges as, you know. So I, I'm not even, I'm gonna take that for granted. I don't mean to write it off, I just, it's real. The sense of panic indicates that it may be, we, we, the culture has not yet figured out how real it is. But I think it's, we're facing not just a moral panic, I think we are in some sense also facing a metaphysical panic in which some of our core ideas is, are being challenged our being Western culture, not, not machine learning experts, not computer scientists, but the culture at large, by um, the encounter with machine learning is challenging some of those core ideas. So the premise of this talk is, uh, um, I think, nothing exceptional. It's that um, we tend to understand ourselves in terms of our dominant tech. So back when clockworks were the greatest tech around, the universe looked like it was ticking along, lots of small pieces, each governed by a noble small set of laws. You put them all together, you get a working universe, a particular type of working universe. In the age of steam, we started to literally feel ourselves to be under pressure and the need to vent and we could spin out of control and all of that terminology comes from, and ideas and feeling and experience comes from uh, our encounter with steam. And in the 1950s with an unbelievable speed, information, we reinterpreted everything, almost literally everything about our lives and world in terms of information. And now it seems to me, uh, I suspect to you as well, that um, machine learning is our dominant technology or it will be. Um, and so we can ask, it's early to ask, but this is all speculative. So we can ask what, what might we look like if we do reinterpret ourselves in terms of this tech? And that's actually what the talk is about. And I think that that change may actually be bigger than the prior epochs of, uh, of um, tech-based self-understanding. So I'm going to, so remember, I'm going to tell you stuff you already know. But what I'm trying to do is uh, show how this might look to non-computer scientists in the culture. So um, traditional program, we, oh, we all know how to do traditional programming, at least to some extent. It actually mirrors very closely how we have thought about how to uh, understand things more broadly. So if your task is to write a program that will enable you to predict uh, quarterly revenues or sales or weather or whatever, the developer has a, a conceptual model about what are the important factors and what are their relationships. So if for sales, obviously, it'll be something like number of salespeople, number of leads, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, and these things are all interrelated. And obviously, this works pretty well. This approach to models is very traditional. It's not new with computing. It, computing just makes it really, really clear how we've been doing this for, uh, I would say, thousands of years. Uh, we, again, the West. Um, <clears throat> 
obviously, machine learning doesn't work that way. We're, we pour in lots of data. The data does depend upon our sense of what might be the relevant data, uh, rele relevant factors, but we do not program in what we think the relationships are between them. And as you know, the system iterates and builds these complex models. Um, and I do understand that there are types of machine learning that are not based on neural networks, but I'm, I think, trying to read the culture that AI is becoming machine learning. Machine learning is being assumed to be a neural network based thing where the way, so the, the way that I think we, we, not you, we are understanding this is that these models consist of the, the system iterates on the data, finds tons and tons and tons of correlations, uh, strong, weak, real, fake correlations, uses this to build a model in which, uh, depending on the architecture, maybe one point connected to all points or to a few points or to lots of points, but a big mess of points in relationships with weights. So complex that the normal thing is we can't understand it. The normal thing this is, is it at least starts life as a black box. And now obviously you just heard about, and, and uh, we, obviously there's lots and lots of work being done trying to put windows into these boxes so we can see into them and understand to some extent what's going on. But we have to do that because they're black boxes. The fundamental understanding I think we're, the culture is going to take away is, yeah, uh, it's a black box. Doesn't mean nothing you can do about it. But that's its fundamental birth state, anyway. This gives us, uh, this is such a contrast to uh, our traditional models for understanding the world, in which we come up with some form of generalization. It can be principles, laws, it could be an architectural sort of thing. Um, we come up with some general understanding, and we use it to explain the particulars. And in the Western tradition, we have strongly preferred the general as the locus of truth and reality. That's what's real because it extends through time. It's more persistent than the per uh, particulars. And you may wonder why that's a characteristic of the real, but that's a different topic. It just happens to be in the West. And machine learning models, not like that. So they don't start with generalizations. They may not yield generalizations at the end, or they may yield generalizations that don't make sense to our human ways of thinking about things. Uh, I, I'm trying to avoid the overfitting, you know, making sure I'm acknowledging overfitting. Um, doesn't start, doesn't end, may not yield generalizations. Rather, the model is characterized by a, a big set of particulars that are in complex weighted relationships of, that can be hugely, hugely complex, that are maybe delicate, may be subject to sort of nonlinear effects. Um, it's really complex. So we have this, this panic, that, a, more, a metaphysical panic, that comes about because and we all hear this one form or another frequently that in a sort of red balloon form of voice, we don't know how it works. We don't know how it works. And that's, all, that's the panic. But that panic only makes sense. It's predicated on the, something internal to that, to that cry of pain, which is it works. It works. It's so, and we can't understand it, but it works. If it didn't work, we wouldn't use it, and we would not have any challenge to our basic understanding of, of how to understand the world. It's the fact that this works that's driving the panic. Uh, for that reason, I think, and I am prone to overstatement, that we may be at a Copernican scale break in our culture. Because all of the prior uh, epochs of understanding ourselves through technology or through philosophical positions as well in the West have had a lot in common that this breaks with. And what, what this breaks with is the notion that we are the special creatures that are able to, for one reason or another, we are able to understand the universe. That is our role, that is our essence. You see this throughout the West and throughout Western history. This is what it means to be human. We are the knowing creatures, we are the rational animals, and so forth. Uh, well, if, in fact, we are, the models that we develop for understanding the, the world, models that work, that's why we use them, in some sense work, then that maybe gives us some indication that the, our old way of doing it, which was, because the, the world's very big, our brains are really small, and so we have uh, pursued this covenant by generalizing, by finding general principles and applying particulars to them, and the truth is in the general. Th that gives us a level of abstraction which our brains can manage. 
but it's also reductive. It, it just, it, I, I think it just is reductive. There, I, don't have to, I don't feel like I have to argue in favor of general principles and laws, but it is a reductive process that works for a very limited creature like us. Or maybe I should just talk for myself, like me. So it, it may be that, um, we, that our encounter with machine learning and with the complexity of models that work and that rely upon particulars is, is giving us a sense that no, our way of understanding the world that made us feel special, it's, that's a, it's, a, it's a great hack. It's a great hack. It's really worked well for us. And this line of thought is showing up all over the place in the culture, basically for the past 100 years, but you can recognize it in, in, uh, in economics and in uh, evolutionary biology and certainly in philosophy as, as well. So <clears throat> what then might it mean for us to reinterpret ourselves in light of machine learning models as appropriated by the culture that is encountering them? And I want to give three examples, and I am so <laughs> concerned about doing this. So the first is how we think about explanations and how we might think about explanations. Um, and, so uh, let's say you're driving down a country road and you get a flat tire. And this is, of course, concerning to you. So you pull over and you look for the explanation. Why did you get the flat tire? And there's the nail. You pull it out and say, oh, I've got my explanation. It's a really good explanation. It's a type of explanation, very common and very important, called a sine qua non explanation. There but for the nail, I wouldn't have gotten the flat. It's a, it's a good explanation. I'm not trying to argue against it. However, there are a whole bunch of other sine qua non. So you were only on that back road because you were late. You're taking a shortcut. So you went to the back road. If you hadn't been late, you wouldn't have gotten the flat. If, uh, if you hadn't swerved for that rabbit, you wouldn't have gotten the flat. If metal were softer than rubber, if pointy things didn't penetrate better than dull ones, if, if, if we didn't like to go places fast, if gravity didn't exist, you wouldn't have gotten the flat. If, if those damn space aliens hadn't failed to harvest our surface iron because they're a rust-based metabolism, you would not have gotten the flat. Everything has to happen for you to get that flat. These are all sine qua non. So why do we pick the nail? out of all of them. And the answer is really, really simple. It's because this is the one thing you can change. You can change the nail and pull it out of the tire. You cannot go back in time and not swerve, uh, run over the bunny on purpose so you'll miss the nail. You can't get rid of gravity. The one thing you can change in this scenario is the nail. So that becomes your explanation. They're all sine qua nons. That's the one that, you can, that works for you. And so it may be that our encounter with machine learning is going to teach us what I've heard actually several times from experts here today in one form or another, which is, yeah, explanations are tools. That is not a common, it is an old philosophical idea, um, at least 100 years old, older, actually. Um, it is not common in the culture, in Western culture, as far as I know. We are learning that perhaps explanations are tools. They're really important tools. We need more and more of them. We are creating new ones for those damn black boxes. It's really important that we do that. But tools are, are useful for some purpose. They are not general, they're not general purpose things. They are designed for purpose. And if explanations are tools, they are also uh, designed for purposes. It's not as if explanations are a feature of the landscape, that the landscape is explicable. It actually doesn't even make sense uh, in, if e explanations are tools. Explanations are little moments of, of light that we shine, that we're able to shine in an overwhelming gloom of, of, of of complication and chaos and confusion uh, and stuff well beyond our human capacities. Explanations are little moments, of, they're little fireflies, they're little lanterns that you put up for a little while because they help you address a problem. The, the landscape is not explicable. It is characterized by being inexplicable. I will put this differently. The universe does not owe us an explanation, and if it did, we couldn't understand it. And yes, the lion's name is Wittgenstein because this is a little bit cribbed. So second is morality. Uh, I'm getting more and more nervous as I stand here. Uh, but, uh, this is a very speculative idea about how our ideas about some of our ideas about morality might change. So um, I'm going to stick with fairness. I think it's really interesting how important, this, important fairness has become in the past 20 years when it, it does not, uh, fairness, uh, uh, Fairness has been taken 
in the Western philosophical tradition often as sort of a folk remedy, as, of, as folk wisdom, sort of beneath the dignity of, of because it's so simple and it, it's seemingly binary, something's fair or it's not. And if you ask somebody what fairness is, I'm not sure why you would, but let's say, because you didn't know, I'm not sure why you don't know that, that actually worries me a little bit. If you ask, um, they're likely, and I, this is statistically valid because I've tried this on five or six people, they will tell you about cookies and children. And they'll say, if you have kids and you, you have in front of you and you give one of them two cookies and one, uh, one you give four, that is unfair. Uh, and it's un unless, unless there is some relevant distinction between them, unless there's some difference that, that matters. And so relevant difference might be that one's small and one's much older. One of them agreed to do more chores to get more cookies because you run a good capitalist family. Uh, there has to be some relevant difference, and that's great. It is a very simple sort of moral principle, uh, but as I think we all know, we spend literally generations, generations arguing and not resolving which differences are relevant. We, it's so hard to go forward from that simple, um, simple definition. Machine learning, as, as we've heard all morning, as you already know, as the what if tool makes clear, uh, forces us to be incredibly specific about exactly what sort of outcomes we want. And that includes, we hope in every case, ethical and fair outcomes. And so this forces a sort of, of specificity that we are not used to in general when thinking about fairness outside of this realm. We like fairness because it seems so simple and binary, and as soon as we try to apply it, we realize how hard it is, how complicated. Machine learning gives us concepts and vocabulary and tools for addressing this, so now it can, the complication of uh, complexity of, um, of fairness can come into view. And, and maybe the, to me the most astounding thing is, remember how you don't because you're young. I'll tell you. Back in the old days, before there were PCs, the thing that the killer app for the PC was a spreadsheet. And the killer feature of the spreadsheet was you can play what if with your business. You can say, oh, well, suppose we hire another 10 salespeople. What will that do? Um, Nonlinear uh, equations usually didn't figure. But you could, you could model and play what if. Incredibly useful and really exciting at the time. Stephen Levy wrote for Wired, like I think in 87 or something. R might have been a little bit later. Uh, really great article c capturing all of this, all of the sort of magic importance of spreadsheets as hypothetical engines. So great, really important. And now you just saw a demonstration of a tool that not only lets you play what if with fairness, it's named the what if tool. <laughs> I, I, I'm not trying to tout the tool. I think we'll see, I, although I really like it, I think we'll see this sort of thing incorporated in lots of places. And as we in our businesses are using machine lear learning in order to um, try to uh, figure out uh, to do stuff and we have to figure out the ethical side of it what sort of outcomes we want and which ones we're going to look at and say well that's unfair that sort of encounter with this sort of tools of vocabulary and concepts of machine learning gives us a vocabulary by which we can start to understand and use the complexity of fairness we can we we can see it. We can play with it. It becomes something that we can manage and, and understand. And so I think not only is fairness about to get appropriately more complex, um, it's it's also going to be something that we will play play with in a what if sort of way as a normal part of of business of using the machine learning systems. That's pretty astounding. That is something we have never ever had. I don't think. I don't think we've ever had a tool that lets us use sliders or uh, wooden pegs or whatever in order to play with fairness the way that these tools do and the way that machine learning, our encounter with machine learning, requires us to. Gives us the tools, lets us use them. And so it becomes fairness. Fairness becomes complex. It's always been complex, right? We are able to recognize that it requires trade-offs, which is sort of anathema to the idea of fairness. You, you trade off fairness, you're, you, are, you are committing, you're being unfair, is what it comes down to. Um, and that, in fact, fair solutions often, I'm going to say, like almost always, they're imperfect. But that's OK, because that's how life is. And now we're able to address this more directly. Now, this is actually a, um, an important change in how we think about morality. I also think it's sort of a more, it's, it's a good step for the species to be able to acknowledge the degree to which 
compromise and imperfection is part even of morality, which for a long time was assumed to be a realm of perfection. Nah, not so much. So the third thing, and I'm getting even more speculative, is um, how we think about meaning. Um, so in 2015, some Google researchers um, did a deep learning project in which they, they fed in images. Uh, boy, that doesn't, you're going to have to buy the book to read that one. <laughs> it's, just a, it's just a small image blown up and big. Um, and I'll tell you what it, what it shows. So they um, asked, it, asked the system, can you generate a, an image from what you've seen of the other images um, in the data set, can, an image of a barbell? And it sort of, it, it did. And this, if you could, you know, if you see this, that's a barbell. There are a bunch of barbells around here. And that's a two-handed human arm with no body in between holding onto the barbells. And so the, the press greeted this as, uh, either as a failure, the system screwed up, or, or actually the stuff I saw and remember is it's sort of an amusing foible. foible. Oh, that funny, funny AI is the best it could do. Um, and I'm not, I'm not convinced this is a failure or a foible. I will tell you why. So um, in Western tradition, since the Greeks, we have thought about the meaning of things, what they are, as being their essence, where the essence is a way of encapsulating what's distinct and unique about a thing, unique from everything else. Um, since Aristotle, all the way up through and past um, Linnaeus's genus species, we've assumed that the essence of something is it, the class that it's in and how it is uniquely distinct from the other members of that class. So in the case of a barbell, if you really don't know what it is, it's something like, its essence it would be something like its exercise equipment, because actually that's, that's the class that it's in. And what makes it distinct is it's got those two plates and it's short and it's used for hand lifting. So that's, that's, that's an essence. And our task in the West has been, surprisingly, to try to fill out the, the plenum, the chart of all possible essences of each thing, because we assumed that it's a rational universe or God created a perfectly orderly universe, and so uh, everything will have an essence and they'll all come together really nicely. It's only about 100 years ago that we started to think, well, that may be not how things work. So this is Martin Heidegger, familiar to many of you. Uh, German philosopher about uh, the personal details about this guy are so repugnant that it's like a parody of, of, of somebody you don't want to reference. But he says something, and I don't want to go into him. You can, we can argue afterwards. It's not going to be an argument. Uh, uh, and, but he said a bunch of things that I think are really important um, and countered much of our Western metaphysical tradition. So um, when he thinks about meaning, he does not think about essence, explicitly doesn't think about the essence of something, which keeps, makes thing, the thing distinct from everything else, but rather about relationships um, by which things are connected. So to take the canonical Heideggerian example, if you want to know what a hammer is, um, and we're not talking in the abstract, if you're a Martian, how, but in our lives, what a hammer is, you really have to know about nails. But to know about nails, you really have to know how wood holds nails, accepts and holds nails, and what we use wood for, for our purposes, for our houses and so forth. And wood comes from trees, and trees come from forests, and forests need rain, and they need sun, and the sun shares the sky with the moon on a, you, know, you have to know everything, because each of these things also has meaning extending outward into a universe of, of relationships, a coherent, sometimes inconsistent, but coherent, I'm not sure what I mean by that, uh, world in which everything is connected one way way or another. And the meaning of something is its place in that universe. So this is, goes against a lot of our Western tradition. We do still have a tendency to, to try to understand things by defining them and saying, which sometimes works, but usually isn't satisfying. So let's say you do a text embedding and you feed in some, I don't know, 40 million Wikipedia pages or whatever, and it does, the machine does its statistical analyses and it builds a 1,024 dimensional space. Does that sound about right? We'll say, OK. A big high dimensional space in which each of the words is connected at some distance from basically every other word. It's a, it, word. It's a co coherent um, representation of a complex, complicated uh, set of things that have their meaning in their relationships. This type of analysis is way closer to a Heideggerian sense of meaning, which I think is the, for me, is 
the better sense of meaning than the essential one. Um, this is close to that. This is like an architecture for it. I'm not saying that this captures the meaning of everything, and, um, but the form of its, uh, of, of its model is close to the form of meaning in this other sense. So if, in Heidegger's sense, um, Heidegger thinks he's expressing an everyday sense of meaning as well, um, which he hopes you will recognize in your own experience. So if our encounter with machine learning includes um, coming into contact with models like this, whether it's for text or other things, that may help change our idea of what constitutes meaning from snipping things apart to seeing how they're related. It's giving a, a model of meaning as messy, complex, fluid, and most of all, connected. So which captures the meaning better? This fuzzy arm thingy on the right or the very crisp and clear one? Well, so this is great if you're looking in a cat, you know what a barbell is, you're looking in a catalog to buy one. This gives you important information, right? It certainly has its place about how it connects or what color it is or, and other things. But it seems to me that if you did, really didn't know what a barbell was, and if this were a little bit more legible, which is my fault, um, this would actually give you a better sense of the meaning of, of a barbell. It's not that barbell isn't this thing in isolation. It's something that you use to do your curls. This makes that much, much clearer, even though it's, it is a little bit of a foible because you know, the arms are weird. But it's just machine learning. So this is the panic, right? We don't know how it works, but it works. And we can, we, obviously, we can help to, we can do a lot of stuff to try to understand how it works. But that's, uh, fundamentally, it's a black box. And I, I'm not, what I want to say is, embrace the black box for one good reason. That it's actually, I think, when you boil it down, it's the world that's the black box. I mean, machine learning black box is nothing compared to the world we live in where we have little flickers of light. We've got great techniques developed over many thousands of years in every culture for understanding the world sufficient that we can, um, we can operate in it, um, we can learn from it. But it is fundamentally a black box and one that is so far beyond our capacity. And so if our culture in the West begins to, to adopt it, then uh, yeah, it's, I understand the metaphysical panic, I think, but I, I actually get a great deal of consolation from this, this view. And I want to tell you, even though I'm, I'm going to spend one minute and I'll be done. Um, so I, I get to hang around at Pear, and I have a few times heard developers go over to another developer and chuckle. And what they say, um, pardon me, I don't mean, what they say is something like, oh my God, I was, I've been training, you know the system I've been training? Uh, on something with text, uh, it just figured out prefixes and suffixes. I, I didn't tell it anything about that. There's no reason I didn't set it to do that. The thing just sort of discovered pre structures of our language. And they say this with a chuckle. I, I can't believe it like that. Because I think it's not just the light and the technology that they've, they've created, the model that they've trained, but it's the fact that in these black boxes in which we don't know how they're working, the system discovers or rediscovers signs and symbols and, and significances that, that work, that come to the surface. And we say, oh, yeah, there are prefixes. How did it know that? There, there is meaning. Here's the point. There is meaning embedded in our world that shows up in unexpected ways in our models. And that chuckle of delight is one of, of happiness about the, the particular model. But more importantly, I think, is an expression of, of joy at the meaning that is in the world that these systems can uncover and, the, and awe at the fact that we can't uncover all of it. Um, that chuckle brings me, makes me very, very happy. Thank you.